Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Thanks very much indeed for the Mises Institute for inviting me to give a talk, and particularly to Pat Burnett, who assisted uh, with the presentation or the, the infrastructure, if you like, of getting the organization uh, of my presentation going. And thank you particularly uh, for you uh, for attending the conference and listening to my talk. As Mark said, Chris Leithner is my name. Um, I run a couple of businesses uh, in a suburb of Brisbane in Australia. My job is basically, or one of my jobs, is to take shareholders' funds, which appear, if you like, as a current asset on a balance sheet, to take cash and to invest it, to convert it into a non-current asset. Uh, my job basically is to allocate capital. Wearing another hat, uh, my job is to take uh, investment institutions' funds and to do much the same sorts of things, to invest it uh, sensibly. I raise that because uh, my job and my presentation before you today is to talk from a much more applied uh, point of view uh, about the linkage uh, between one style of investing uh, and the Austrian school. I've chosen the title, uh, Ludwig von Mises Meet Ben Graham, Value Investing from an Austrian Point of View, because it struck me for several years, a lot of years, I dare say, that uh, when I talk uh, to Austrian school people about investing topics, uh, there's not too much about which we disagree. Um, when Austrians conversely talk to uh, a particular style of value investors about that, there seems to be a fair bit of commonality. And I'd go as far to say that, and I'm perhaps stretching it, uh, but we'll see how far I can stretch it, that value investors and Austrian school economists may well have more in common than uh, value investors have with their mainstream and Austrian school people have with the economics mainstream. Now, my purpose today is not to explain that, but perhaps to describe it to show some of the ways uh, in which there are uh, a fair few uh, commonalities. I've chosen the title almost as if um, two gentlemen meet at a relatively formal function, two people whom I think, gee, uh, these two gentlemen have a fair bit in common. It would be useful to introduce them such that they themselves can perhaps can explore their commonalities uh, to perhaps from first principles to explain why those commonalities might exist. Just a wee disclaimer, my apologies for that. My purpose today is not, NOT, is not to sell you uh, any securities, not to provide legal accounting financial advice. Um, I've presented or I've, I've prepared uh, a written paper available either from the website towards the bottom or thanks to Pat Barnett uh, by way of the Mises Institute. Uh, in the time allotted to me, I haven't the, um, the time to discuss it in any great detail. Perhaps what I'll give to you is uh, a hitchhiker's guide following the points which I've just now raised. Let me talk to you briefly as an audience, by and large, of Austrian school economists or people interested in the Austrian school and not so much as value investors, a couple of points uh, about value investing. Let me talk very briefly uh, about Ben Graham, both an investor um, and an adjunct academic uh, at the Columbia B School uh, from roughly the mid-1920s to roughly the late 1940s. Graham was born in London at a relatively early age, moved to New York City, uh, was something of a prodigy as a student, graduated from Columbia, was offered three academic posts at Columbia, one in mathematics, two in classics, which was a lifetime passion and interest of his. And I confess uh, on the spot off the top of my head, the third one might have been English, but don't quote me upon that. But a man with a very eclectic, a very, very wide-ranging set of views, Throughout his life, and indeed, uh, as, you, as you read in his autobiography, investing per se was by no means uh, the most important thing in his life. Uh, if anything, uh, classics, the study of classics, uh, was a greater passion for him uh, than was the allocation uh, of capital. To give a, a very brief overview summary, what on earth is this thing value investing, at least as uh, he's described it? Ah, one or two other points. It, the Great Depression uh, was very hard on Graham, just as it was on many other people. Uh, he founded an investing investment company in the mid-1920s, uh, which did extraordinarily well during the boom of the 1920s, like many other investing companies did extremely badly in the early 1930s. And that prompted him uh, to go back to first principles, um, to uh, explain to himself what went wrong, and equally importantly, uh, to present some principles uh, to go forward. Uh, that book, Security Analysis, is often described uh, as a foundation stone for investing. It's often described that way, but I dare say relatively few people these days will read it from cover to cover. To my knowledge, which admittedly is limited knowledge, certainly in Australia, it'll never appear on a B-school curriculum, and I'd venture a guess in this country as well, 
uh, it may well be mentioned on occasion, but certainly not uh, utilized um, uh, that extensively, even though there have been multiple editions uh, and the book uh, is still in print. Graham uh, retired in around about the mid-1950s uh, among his students and colleagues uh, at Graham Newman Corp, his investing, uh, investment company, uh, was Warren Buffett, who obviously went on to, uh, to much greater and much more prominent things. Uh, Graham, if anything, eschewed publicity. Uh, Mr. Buffett, it seems to me, uh, doesn't necessarily attract it, but the publicity uh, comes his way nonetheless. Right, now having said that in terms of background, according to Graham, investment is most successful when it's most businesslike. An investment operation is one that, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and a satisfactory, satisfactory return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. Grahamites, first and foremost, are analysts, as I'll say a fair bit more, are analysts of businesses. What they are not are people who stare at a screen and notice a blip of a price which goes up or down uh, from one hour to the next, one day to the next week or month. Uh, their interest uh, is very much in uh, the business uh, that they're looking at. Businesses have securities, obviously, but their interest is in the tangible business which underlies uh, security. Their objective, their passion is to analyze that business, to ascertain the value of that business, to compare value to price, hence the label value investing, when their assessment of uh, value is greater than price to buy, uh, if their assessment of value uh, doesn't meet those criteria, um, to step aside. You can see a commonality, though. I've put a, a quote from, uh, from Human Action uh, from von Mises. Stock exchange transactions produce neither profits nor losses, but are the consummation of profits and losses arising in commerce and manufacturing. I take that quote to be, look at the underlying economic, tangible economic activity, the market exists in order to make transactions, but the market, a financial market per se, the blips on a screen, are not the be-all and end-all. In actual fact, uh, it's businesses producing ultimately goods and services for consumers. That is the be-all uh, and end-all of investing. The final point then, on a day-to-day -day basis, the operations of a business are much more stable than any assessment of its value. Assessments of value will change virtually instantaneously, but it seems to be certainly in, in, with respect to relatively well-established businesses, uh, they're much more stable. And that's uh, an insight, it seems to me, that um, Graham was uh, properly able to, um, uh, to take advantage of during his career. Uh, certainly Mr. Buffett's done so since then. Just another couple of points in terms of uh, overview. Focusing on that distinction between price and value, it's certainly not a mainstream sort of a notion, repeating a point I made at the outset, to talk to Austrian school economists about the distinction between price and value, to say that price is what's paid, value is what's received, that elicits little, if any, uh, dissent, no arguments there. Second point, Graham observed that over time, price and value tend to gravitate towards one another. Sometimes it can take a fair while to do so. At any given point, they may well diverge, sometimes by quite a wide margin. Uh, and indeed, from one minute to the next, they may well diverge. They'll eventually converge, but uh, they won't instantaneously do so. They won't necessarily do so from one moment to the next. Graham also lamented that most people rarely recognize, very few willfully, and a few, uh, sorry, more than a few will willfully ignore, that fundamental distinction between price and value. That's certainly not a mainstream notion. Price are, and value are synonyms, um, according to the mainstream, in terms of the catechisms uh, taught in business school, uh, and people will scratch their heads, or mainstream people will scratch their heads if you put these points to them. Final point on that slide, value investors, investors seeking value, which may well and often does differ from price, will reject the mainstream view that these two things, price and values, necessarily coincide um, at all times. There's a fair bit of commonality, it seems to me, between Graham and I selected Mises as a relatively accessible source on investing um, risk, on what investing risk is. For mainstream or for MBAs taught uh, in, uh, in B schools, uh, the risk of an investment is the price volatility or the risk of a listed investment, which is the overwhelming concentration, uh, is volatility. The more volatile it's been in, say, the recent past, what's that, a week, a month, a year, the more volatile it is, the riskier it is. For Graham, that's patently absurd. Risk uh, resides in a tangible business, its degree of success in the past, currently, under plausible assumptions how successful it's likely to be going forward, largely on the basis of accounting criteria, return on capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the price, if, or the volatility from one moment to the next is of virtually no interest to Grahamites, with the one exception if it enables them to buy uh, a quality asset 
at a decent price. A couple of other points uh, on that, and I'll just read uh, from Mises, and it struck me because it's, it's something that uh, Graham uh, could easily have written. I dare say he wished uh, that uh, he had uh, um, uh, written. According to Mises, I'll quote, a popular fallacy considers entrepreneurial profit a reward for risk-taking. It looks upon the entrepreneur as a gambler who invests in a lottery after having weighed the favorable chance of winning a prize against the unfavorable chance of losing his stake. This operation manifests itself most clearly in the description of stock exchange transactions as a sort of gambling, which is very similar to what, if you like, uh, a typical newspaper account will be, if price is rising today, falling today, garden, back garden conversation in terms of my investments are doing well, they're not doing so well, and so on. Mises continues, quote, Every word in this description is false. The owner of capital does not choose between more risky, less risky, and safe investments, He's forced by the very operation of the market economy to invest his funds in such a way as to supply the most urgent needs of the consumers to the best possible extent. The success or failure of the investment in stocks, bonds, etc., etc., depends ultimately upon the same factors that determine the success or failure of the capital invested. And as I say, that's something that Graham could ease. The thought is a very Grahamite thought. I dare say he wished uh, he'd expressed it that eloquently. Risk, then, has to do with tangible businesses, their operations. It has to do not with uh, squiggles on a line from one moment to the next. I haven't the time to go through the paper point by point, which is just as well, and I certainly, certainly shan't read from it or quote from it, but there are eight points of commonality I put up in my paper. I've mentioned two of them thus far, a distinction between price and value, conception of risk, a third point of commonality I put within parentheses that Grahamites are methodological individualists. I dare say I stretch the point slightly. The individualists in this sense that their relentless focus, their concentration, their passion is in the individual business which, they're being, which is being analyzed. An individual business which has individual securities. Their interest is not in the market or not in a market average, a market aggregate, be it um, the Standard & Poor's 500, the All Ordinaries Index, any of many other indices. They're not looking at that aggregate level, rather at the more, within quotations, individual business level. So if you like, a, a business analyst is um, a reasonable handle for them. A fourth point of commonality is a skepticism about mathematical modeling. For Graham, in his experience, the more fancy the mathematics, the more arcane the assumptions, the more likely the person doing the assuming, the more likely the person utilizing the mathematics was speculating rather than investing. He was very cautious about anything beyond ordinary arithmetic in terms of the sorts of things one would need to analyze a balance sheet, a profit and loss statement, and so on. It's stretching slightly, but not very much, dare I say it, to say that little more than primary school mathematics is required to be a Graemite investor, which is just as well. Certainly the arcane stuff uh, with which uh, MBAs would be exposed is not just alien to a Graemite, but they'd be not just very skeptical about it, but I dare say they'd run uh, as fast as their feet can carry them from it. A fifth point, the future is largely but not radically uncertain. Grahamite would say, look, they would be comfortable with the notion there exist laws of economics, there exists historical data, and on the basis of those sorts of things, one, they're prepared to look very cautiously into the future. That's not to say that they're making forecasts that the price of a stock will be X in six months' time. They're saying, look, based upon the laws of economics, their analysis of a business, uh, that a reasonable price is likely to be no more than such and such. And if you buy it today on the basis of their experience going back now, the better part of three quarters of a century, one is likely to do it reasonably well. But that's not the same thing, if you like, as a, as a point forecast. They're much more comfortable with saying, look, uh, given this information, we're rather unlikely uh, to end up disastrously wrong. Sixth point is that value investors uh, are Austrian entrepreneurs in a specific way in the way that, for example, Israel Kirzner described uh, entrepreneurs, not so much, not at all in the way that, for example, Josef Schumpeter might have described um, uh, entrepreneurs. I'm grateful for Robert Blumen for distinguishing the two uh, more clearly than, than I would have. Value investors seek to discover things which other people have, for whatever reason, overlooked. They're not the sort of people uh, who, in a sense, are creating utterly and completely new things, engaging in the process of creative destruction, uh, going where no person has gone before. So the entrepreneurs in that uh, Kersnerian sense as opposed to a, a Schumpeterian sense. 
I'll skip in terms of time available, but I've drawn another distinction in terms of their uh, views about capital, capital goods. I have given an example. Austrians don't, or I beg your pardon, Grahamites don't use the phrase time preference. To my knowledge, it's a, uh, the phrase itself uh, isn't used by them. The underlying logic, though, is something they use virtually on a daily basis. They constantly talk in terms of payback periods. Making an investment today, how long is it likely for the fruits I expect uh, to be generated? They seek the, the smallest possible payback period. The longer it is, the greater risk becomes in terms of unanticipated things which might occur between now and then. So I'm stretching it a bit, but I don't think dramatically so, to say that, look, there's a, not a complete uh, commonality, but a sufficient commonality to be intriguing in terms of uh, the views of time preference and the concepts that uh, stem from it, uh, namely interest and um, an investor's rate of return. Let me say a few points in terms of, a few points more, I should say, a bit of detail, in terms of the distinction between price and value. A price to a Grahamite is set at the margin. A, pr a price is a ratio at which the most eager uh, person, say the most eager buyer and the most eager seller, voluntarily exchange some specified good service, commodity, stock or bond. A buyer is most eager in the sense that he or she is willing to exchange it for the greatest amount of some other commodity, say money. A seller is most eager in the sense that uh, he's prepared to accept less money for it than any other seller. You might shrug your shoulders and say, well, that's elementary, and indeed I agree that it is. Those comments are not from an Austrian school economist. They are from John Burr Williams, his book, The Theory of Investment Value, published in 1938. The margin, says John Burr Williams, who is a colleague is pushing it, uh, acquaintance of uh, Graham, in, in Williams' words, the margin will fall between owners and non-owners, the ins and the outs, the eyes and the nays, and this margin, opinion, mere opinion, will determine actual price. An opinion is not the same thing as a fact, and Grahamites, I dare say, are very familiar with the notion that some actors will be better informed than others. The mainstream notion that all buyers and sellers, all market participants have the same information, they would reject. The notion that all buyers and sellers would react in the same way to that information, they'd reject, and with it comes a rejection of uh, quite a lot of um, uh, contemporary finance. So on that point, again, an uh, uh, initial point of, um, uh, of elaboration. To say, for example, that Security X is selling at such and such a price on this particular Friday in February at this moment uh, basically has to do with the opinions expressed by, uh, ultimately, uh, two different people. Whether they're well informed, whether there's other information that can be brought to bear, that's a different issue um, entirely. Prices are neither omniscient nor prescient. Briefly, let me summarize that point, not from Graham, but from um, uh, Jim Grant, uh, who quotes from um, uh, Graham occasionally. Grant says this, I quote, To suppose that the value of a common stock is determined purely by a corporation's earnings, discounted uh, by the relevant interest rate and adjusted for the marginal tax rate, is to forget that people have burned witches, gone to war on a whim, risen to the defense of Joseph Stalin and believed Orson Welles when he told them over the radio that the Martians had landed. Actors in markets are not necessarily well-informed uh, actors. To say that the price of something sells for X today uh, is not necessarily an accurate reflection uh, of underlying value. As a rule, disbelieve the media, another, if you like, implication stemming from the point. Uh, a lot of silly things, and it's no news to you, uh, appear on the news from day to day. The fact that if uh, a market index falls on a given day, quite often journalists will talk about a sell-off, which is silly because for every security that's sold, there has to be a corresponding buyer. There has to be, uh, for every person selling, there has to be a buyer. Why not call it uh, a buy-off? It's then simply silly to talk about a rush to get out of the market, a rush to get into the market. Why? Because the queue is going in either direction. The one balances the other, ignoring IPOs uh, and the like on a given day. The number of securities at the end of the day is identical to that at the beginning of the day. It's simply silly to talk about uh, a rush in one direction uh, or the other. Let me skip to my conclusion then, running short on time, from an applied point of view, from the point of view of um, uh, someone who runs an investment company uh, and who interacts with investing institutions, the relevance of Austrian economics. Point one, it helps to inoculate against absurdity. And I've put in a quote there, the next time somebody tells you with a straight face that all investors have the same information, expectations, time horizon, that markets are very liquid, making transaction costs so small that they can be ignored, 
and that the value that and that value and price are synonyms. The next time they tell you that, it seems to me the sane response is simply to laugh. Um, Austrian economics, if you like, and I can uh, stretch the analogy, a prophylactic against a lot of silly things uh, that one hears and reads on a daily basis. Second point helps to avoid over-optimism and unwarranted pessimism. Jim Grant has a really good quote at the beginning. I put it in the paper. He um, equates Austrian economics, if you like, uh, to the ability to avoid getting up in the middle of the light and stumbling over the lampshades or the, the, the lampstand and so on. The future is always unlit, but it helps to have a theoretical edifice that enables you sometimes to avoid the more severe injuries of stumbling over lamps and, um, and lampshades and furniture in the middle of the night. And I think that really that encapsulates the point uh, far better than, um, than I could. The final point, and I'll stop with perhaps a minute or so left, is that for businessmen and investors, or business people and investors, Graham said the two are in effect identical, that to be a good investor you have to be a good business person and vice versa. Austrian school economics, it's neither necessary nor sufficient, that's to say, to be a good Austrian school economist. That has no necessary implications for your style of investing. To be a Grahamite investor doesn't necessarily predispose you towards the Austrian school. The point of my paper, though, is to show that it seems to me there's a fair bit of overlap, an intriguingly big overlap, um, such that these things are neither necessary or sufficient, but goodness me, by my experience, um, it certainly helps. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention.